Does my mic work here? Yes. I want to start off and explain why I'm here talking about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It started for me when I was an undergrad at University of California, Santa Cruz, and I got involved with a program to build one of the first ever optical SETI instruments, and I did this for my undergraduate thesis, and we installed it at Lick Observatory, which was the first mountaintop observatory in the world above San Jose and San Francisco. And it was through that experience that I've stuck with SETI throughout my astronomical career. And I will explain some of that story later in today's talk. To start off, though, I want all of us to think about waking up tomorrow morning, and the first thing you hear in the news, it's not Donald Trump, the first thing you hear in the news is that scientists have received a clear, unambiguous signal from extraterrestrial intelligence. That's right, we were just contacted by another alien civilization. Now, what would that mean to each of you? No, really, what would that mean to you? And, <laughs> and what would, do you think that would mean for all of us here on planet Earth together? Okay. This question of whether we are alone is a question we've brought with us for thousands, tens of thousands of years. It's part of our human journey. Now, to take us to understanding where we are today for the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, I need to take you back all the way back to the Big Bang. And to do this, I'm gonna show you my most favorite image ever taken by humanity. My most favorite picture, this is it. It was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. It's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Hubble looked at one tiny patch of the sky. In fact, if you extend your arm out, you had a pencil or a pen, it's that tip of that pencil is the area of the sky. Just imagine doing that right now, right over there. And Hubble opened its shutters for 50 days, allowed all of those photons streaming through the universe to come into its telescope to make this image. Everything you see here, and the projector doesn't do it justice. Everything you see or every single smudge is another galaxy. Maybe but minus one or two foreground stars in our own Milky Way. Okay. Do you want, can you hear me better now? 
Am I just louder but still garbled? <laughs> it's muffled? Let's see if it's my mouth. Um, yeah, I can do that. Is, I have three mics now. Is this better? Now I just need to fill my mouth with some marbles or something here. All right. Every little smudge you see here is another galaxy. Remember, that's a tiny patch of the sky. Okay? And in fact, if you integrate across the entire sky, you get about 100 billion observable galaxies in our universe. 100 billion. Now, we are living in just one of those 100 billion galaxies. We live in the Milky Way. It's a spiral-like galaxy similar to this. It's an analog to our Milky Way. Beautiful spiral. You have the urban center with the bulge and then the spiral arms. And we live about here in this galaxy, if we were in this galaxy. So there's about 100 billion stars in a galaxy. I can't hold two things here. Um, there's about 100 billion stars in a galaxy, and we know that there's 100 billion other there's stars. 100 billion galaxies, each galaxy has 100 billion stars. You multiply 100 billion galaxies by 100 billion stars, it's 8 o'clock Saturday night. You get a whole lot of stars, okay? Just, right? It's just a lot of stars. In fact, it's 10 to the 22. One with 22 zeros at the end of it is the number of stars in our observable universe. Okay, those are the odds here. Now, our planet orbits the sun. And then the next question should be, are there other planets orbiting other stars? And recently, astronomers have figured this out. Today, we know of thousands of other planets that orbit around other stars. Those planetary systems or solar systems come in all shapes and sizes. Sometimes you get the mass of Jupiter that's orbiting really close to the star. Sometimes they're really far away, like our own Jupiter here in our solar system. Sometimes you get multiple systems. Sometimes they orbit two stars like Tatooine in Star Wars. I mean, what we have discovered in the last decade about extrasolar planets should blow our minds, really blow our minds. 20 years ago, we only knew of one solar system in this entire universe, and that was our own. But now, today, there are thousands of other solar systems, other extrasolar planets. Now, that's great for science fiction, but it's fantastic for thinking about whether there's life on those other worlds. These surveys have found that most stars have at least one planet around them. And that smaller planets, like Earth, Venus, and Mars, are more common than the gas giants. Now this number should blow everybody's mind. One out of five stars has an Earth-sized planet. 20% of stars that are similar to our sun have an Earth-sized planet. I say Earth-sized, there's that distinction. We don't know if it's Earth-like. We need to still learn a ton about these other systems, whether they have water or atmospheres, we don't know yet. There are a lot of emissions that are coming online for us to figure this out. But what we do know about extrasolar planets should only increase our odds and increase the likelihood that there potentially could be other life out there and that there could be potentially other intelligent life out there. I really believe that when they write a textbook back you know, 2100, 
this discovery will be revolutionary, like this discovery alone, that planets are plentiful. Now, it takes time to get where we are today. Okay. Our solar system began about five billion years ago. Astronomers like big numbers, you can see this, five billion years ago. You know, and we took time for life to evolve. And it took time for not only life to evolve to intelligent life, but it took time for intelligent life to have technology and to have a civilization. We are just a sliver of that five billion years of time. And time is an important part of this equation of asking whether there's other intelligent life existing with us right now, today. Maybe they existed 20,000 years ago, but we weren't around. The other promising thing, thing about life is that it's at every nook and cranny. Okay. Astrobiology in the last couple decades have discovered that life exists in every nook and cranny on planet Earth, at the bottoms of the sea floors and thermal vents, to the coldest reaches of Antarctica, in the depths of ice cores. There's life. Somehow it survives through different temperatures, different pressures, different salinities, different pHs. There's life. Our planet is rich with it. Understanding life and its evolution, that too, we still have a lot to figure out. All of these things are part of the equation of trying to understand whether we are alone. Now, it's Saturday night. This is big questions, guys. Um, we've been speculating about this for thousands of years, as I said. I love this quote from Tang Moon and Sung Dynasty, okay, 1000 AD. Empty space is like a kingdom, and earth and sky are no more than a single individual person in that kingdom. Upon one tree are many fruits, and in one kingdom there are many people. How unreasonable it would be to suppose that, besides the earth and sky we can see, there are no other skies and no, under, no other earths. I just, I love this, that this innate curiosity of asking whether we are alone has just always been with us. Now, an individual in 1959 decided to take all of these elements of time, stars, number of planets, number of galaxies, and try to think about the likelihood of life in the universe. This was Frank Drake, and he wanted to come up with an equation to try to figure out how many civilizations there exist. And this is known as the Drake Equation. Has anybody ever heard of the Drake Equation? Yeah, that's cool. Well, I have my own version of the Drake Equation. So I'm gonna go walk us through it. This is, I swear this is the only part with math in this talk. Okay. How many civilizations, okay, my variables n civ, exist in the Milky Way right now? Okay, so n civ is equal to the number of stars in the Milky Way, the fraction of habitable planets that are around those stars, the fraction where life exists, the fraction that develops civilization or technology, and then the fraction that exists right now. So I'm gonna go through a couple things here. Let's go through. I'm going to say the number of stars is 200 billion. Fraction of how about planets, 1 to 10 percent. Maybe you think that's optimistic. This you're really going to think is optimistic. Fraction of life, 10 percent to 100 percent. Just bear with me. Fractions of civilizations, 1 percent. Okay. Fractions that exist now. 0.001, which means the civilizations live for 10 million years. How many people think we're gonna exist for 10 million years? Yes, I love it. Stay optimistic. Um, yeah, so this gives you a number that's one in 100 million to one in a million. 
Then there are 2,000 to 200,000 civilizations today in the Milky Way. Cool, it's like Star Trek. But this is cool if you're an anthropologist, right? I think Jean-Luc Picard in Star Trek Next Generation wanted to be an anthropologist. There may have been two to 200 million before, okay? Because they only lived for 10 million years. But the lifetime of our universe is long. All right, so some of you, I think, thought I was being a little optimistic. You can play with these numbers, um, but the longevity of a civilization is key to whether we are alone today. Okay. So let's say the civilizations live for only 10,000 years. Maybe an asteroid hits us, maybe something else happens, maybe climate change, we don't know. Okay. That means that the number of civilizations is one in a hundred billion to one in a billion. If civilizations only last 10,000 years, then there are only two to 200 other civilizations existing with us today in the Milky Way. Now these are my own numbers. I welcome you to just Google the Drake equation at home and play with them yourself too. You can, there's these online calculators and see what you think maybe. I don't know the answer to this. But the importance of this, and Carl Sagan recognized the importance of this, is that if there's other intelligent life existing with us today, they're likely been around a while. Okay, that's the probability. And they're likely much more advanced than us. Okay. You guys can hear me okay, right? Yeah. That'd be awful just sitting up here talking. Okay. If there was another extraterrestrial intelligent civilization existing with us now, what methods of communication do you think they would be using to communicate with us? Yeah. Um, radio, waves. radio waves. Great. Any others? Yeah. Cyphers. Sorry? Cyphers. Cyphers? Code, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. So they're coding a message? Yeah, over oh, there. Yep, you. Gravitational waves, cool. It's expensive, but cool. <laughs> so gotta make, you gotta get the coal of the supermassive. Yeah, over here. Yeah, his, he, he stated that they're just, they're gonna just drive on over here and take one or two people and drive on back. All right. It's important to think about this. Um, it's important to think about how we do communication today, and in particular, long-range communication and how that's evolved. Right, we've gone from carrier post. We can literally start throwing rocks into space. Right, that's one way to communicate. The young gentleman here said radio waves. Very good, that's light. It's a very good method. It travels at the fastest speed limit in the universe. Today, we use cell phones. It's remarkable that every person in this room, I think every person, likely have a cell phone in their pocket. Okay, a few others. So today we have a handheld communications where we can call any other place on the globe. That too also uses light. So what is SETI? SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It uses astronomical and scientific methods to look for signals sent from extraterrestrial intelligence, from another technology. We need to have technological proof and scientific proof that there would be another alien civilizations communicating with us. Now the challenge for this is that in astronomy we use light, otherwise known as electromagnetic radiation. And light can travel at all different frequencies all the way from low energy light, from radio waves, we use radio waves a lot to communicate long range to even our satellites, all the way to high energy light like gamma rays and x-rays. In order to detect a signal, if they were using indeed light, we'd have to know what frequency they were sending the signal. And that's part of the challenge. Okay? Astronomers, we have telescopes that go all across 
these wavelengths of light to study different parts of the universe. So we try to use those methods and twist them around a little bit to try to look for other technological or artificial signals. And that's really the premise of SETI. The first scientific paper, because I showed a 1000 AD quote, but the first scientific paper happened in 1959, same year that Frank Drake did his equation, by Konecki and Morris. And in this paper, they have this quote that I like. It says, the probability of success is difficult to estimate. Success meaning we measure a signal and we get a signal. But if we never search, the chance of success is zero. Okay, this was their argument that we needed to do study to look for extraterrestrial signals. Now that was the first scientific paper. Um, Nikola Tesla was obsessed with Martians. He really believed that Martians were existing on Mars. And he had an experiment that was set up in northern Colorado to try to transmit signals without wires. Of course, Nikola Tesla is famous for alternating current and electricity. And in one of his experiments, he thought he received a signal. And he was convinced it was Martians. And they announced it. It was in the paper, and here's a golden hours. And it was later found out that it was wrong. And so they say, to Mars with Tesla, because he did a false announcement. This was the first learning lesson with SETI, is that if you ever do get a signal, you better be darn sure it's real. In 1924, David Todd was a US astronomer, and he too was convinced that there were Martians on Mars. And he asked the US Naval Observatory and all of the industries, radio industries, on the East Coast to stop communicating. Don't transmit radio wavelengths. Let's go to radio silence. And we're going to take our radio telescopes and listen to see if the Martians were communicating with us. Okay. These searches, right? This is like, we're thinking about ET is like next door at Mars, right? Within our own solar system. The first study search that occurred outside our solar system was by Frank Drake. He used the Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia to listen for radio signals from two nearby stars that are similar to our sun, Tau Ceti and Epsilon Eridani. He listened to them for weeks. And he would take his radio and he would look at frequency to frequency to frequency to hear if they're signal. Nothing was received. NASA conducted SETI for a while on multiple telescopes until it was cut. Excuse me, let me get a glass of water. Government funding in the US funded SETI until 1988, and it was cut. Now, this was challenging for the SETI community because they needed funds to purchase the telescope time. But the good thing that came out of this is that Carl Sagan wrote a fantastic book called Contact, which was later made into a movie by Matthew McConaughey and Jodie Foster, here pictured here. That first third of the film tells a true story about that challenge with getting no funding and looking to private industry to try to get funds. How many people have seen Contact? This is a selection bias, I think, to this audience here. But <laughs> if you haven't seen it, I think it stands the test of time. Um, so Jodie Foster was based off Jill Tarter. Um, and Jill Tarter worked with Jodie Foster for part of that film. And Carl had to tell Jill that she was going to be part of this film. And Jill's um, pet project was Project Phoenix. Okay. And she was interested in not looking at just one or two stars, but looking at many stars, and in this case, about 710 stars, but looking at them at many frequencies, not just a single frequencies, but many, many, many frequencies to hear if there's any signals. She used Arecibo in Puerto Rico to do these observations. There's also other searches that happen where they piggybacked on top of Arecibo and other telescopes. And this generated SETI at home, which was a screensaver that could download SETI observations from the radio telescopes, bring it to your 
personal computer, your personal computer would run it and then send the data back because they're trying to find a needle in the haystack. And folks at Berkeley said, well, we need a supercomputer to process all of the data we have to search to see if ET is communicating with us. And they thought, well, wait a minute, if there's enough personal computers scattered around the globe, if we unite them, we'll make a gigantic supercomputer. And they did that. And this also spent, like, um, spawned into many other scientific endeavors where you could download Lady and process on your personal computer and send it back. That's mine. I have lost my talk here. Wow. Hang on, guys. Oh, there it is. That's so weird. Okay, you have a question. Can I comment at the end of the talk about WOW? Because there's been a lot of work actually done on WOW recently. So I have a lot to say about it. Um, okay, we're back. Okay, any other questions? We can keep this free form. Like one question, yeah. There's a lot in those two questions. Um, it's complicated to know whether just if a planet already exists with life, whether it can just life can spontaneously generate. People try to do this. That's a complicated question. Um, evolution is a complicated question too because we have many stops and goes. If you look at the evolutionary tree, there is many species that have been before us, millions, hundreds of millions before us that have had dead ends. Okay, so more comments about that at the end. Okay, we've done study for about 50 years. Um, and we've had a number of telescopes do this. This is radio study of the number of simultaneous frequencies versus year. That project Ozma represents what Frank Drake did in 1960. We've had Moore's law growth, meaning as computers and transistors got better, our searches got better. You can see all of the different searches we have here. And the question I have for you is, well, should we quit? We don't have a clear, unambiguous signal yet. And to answer that, I like to look at um, one of my favorite cartoons here. It's two ants talking to each other. One ant says, we've searched dozens of these floor tiles for several common types of pheromone trails. If there was intelligent life up there, we would have seen its message by now. The world's first ant colony to achieve sentience calls out this, calls out the search for us. Thank you. In 1960, we've had Moore's law of growth, meaning as computers and transistors got better, our searches got better. You can see all of the different searches we have here, and the question I have for you is, well, should we quit? We don't have a clear, unambiguous signal yet. And to answer that, I'd like to look at um, one of my favorite cartoons here. It's two ants talking to each other. One ant says, we've searched dozens of these floor tiles for several common types of pheromone trails. If there was intelligent life up there, we would have seen its message by now. The world's first ant colony to achieve sentience calls out this, calls out the search for us. So how we communicate is important. And we've done 50 plus years of radio setting, and we still have a lot more to do in that area. We have barely, barely searched. Jill Tarter always equates this as walking over to the ocean with a pint glass. You scoop up the water, you look into that pint glass, and you see it. there is no fish in this pint glass. Therefore, there is no fish in the ocean. <laughs> the phase space in radio frequency the fraction of sky we look all around us, and how sensitive we are to the signal, if it's a faint signal or a bright signal. We have to search all of that. And if you notice, all of these searches 
are at radio frequencies. But there are other wavelengths of light. In 1961, an amazing man, Charles Towns at Bell Laboratories, invented the maze oven, otherwise known as the laser. He wins the Nobel Prize for this. Soon after he invents the laser, he writes a nature paper that says that lasers would be one of the best means of communicating interplanetary, between our planet and the solar system, and interstellar, between the stars. He realized not only the industrial applications of lasers, right? <laughs> but he also realized the importance of communication long distance across the universe. They're black. They're easy to beam. They're really bright. This is very low power, but it's super bright. You can all see it around the room right now. And I can set a lot of content in it. Okay. So I'm going to talk about coding and cycling. I can put a lot of information in this laser. And I can direct it to somebody. I can go talk to the Klingons over here and not let the Romulans over here hear about it. And it's bright. Okay. In 1961, though, if you took the brightest laser on Earth with the largest telescope and you combined them, you could only make a signal that went about a tenth of a light year away. So, but that's 1961. In present day technology, we can do much, much better. This is a milliwatt, 10 to the minus 3. The most powerful lasers we have on Earth are 10 to the 15 watts. Sounds like I'm an evil James Bond character. 10 to the 15 watts. Okay. If you combine that with the largest 10 meter telescope, you can outshine our sun. Remember, a laser is a single wavelength. You can outshine the sun by all of its wavelengths combined by factors of thousands. You can make a signal. Today we have the technology to send a signal to other galaxies, not just other stars within our Milky Way. We today have that technology. We don't do it. We don't do it. But we have the technology. So optical setting, the premise of it really should say laser setting. But optical setting looks for laser signals at optical wavelengths. Okay. The challenge with radio is that you have to scan in frequency. Imagine if you're driving in the desert and you need, you want some music and you can't get a signal, so you're scanning 96.7, 96.8, right? You're looking for your signal. Same is true for the receivers that we use on telescopes. But optical setting is looking for a big, bright laser signal, and in some cases a light laser flash that would be very distinguishable from anything else, astrophysically or terrestrial. It's basically saying, this is like the bonfire on a strand island, hey, over here, because the lasers are that bright. So Charles Towns wrote this paper in 1961, these ideas about looking for laser signals, how this would be a good communication. But the first laser or optical study search occurred in 1998 by Harvard and Princeton. They built a dedicated telescope to try to look for optical signals from extraterrestrials. To do this, they used the best detectors of the time, which are called photomultiplying tubes. They can get them in nanosecond resolution, so you can look for very, very, very bright pulses. Now, remember when I said I was an undergrad, and I got involved with the SETI Institute, got involved with working with Frank Drake, and I did my undergraduate thesis building a new type of detector to detect for optical and laser signals. We commissioned this in um, the year 2000. We ran it for about five years. This again was at the observatory. Um, here's the old gangs. Dan Rodemer, he was the creator of um, SETI at Home. I just talked about Red Stone as the director of this observatory, there's a little me, and that's Frank Drake. And we started the search 
for doing um, optical setting, laser setting, to look for laser pulses coming from ET. And we looked at about 5,000 stars, mostly sun-like stars. And remember in 2000, we really didn't know planets were planetful then. So we kind of just picked stars that are like our sun. But now we know that there's planets everywhere, which has kind of changed the way we do study today. Now, there was something bothering all of us when we were doing these optical study searches. And again, that has to do with the wavelength of light. This is what the Milky Way looks like at optical wavelengths. Kind of, if you've ever been in a dark place, right out in the desert or camping, You've seen the Milky Way in the night sky. It's patchy, right? That patchy business here is intervening dust and gas. The bright stuff you see here are the stars that are emitting optical light, but that get absorbed by the gas and dust that are between the stars. If you then could put on near infrared goggles, you guys see them in like military, right? Where they put on the goggles to see it. And let's say we had those goggles. And then we looked up at the Milky Way. This is what we would see. It's transparent. All of those longer wavelengths, the infrared light, just comes streaming through the Milky Way. And in fact, when Charles Towns wrote his paper in 1961, he said, if you were to communicate with the laser between stars at long distances, you probably want to go in the infrared so you don't get absorbed by gas and dust. Why didn't we do infrared 20 years ago? We didn't have the detectors and the technology to do the search, that's why. But we do today. Near infrared technology is booming because of all the cell phones that are in your pockets and purses right now. And because of other things, like defense for missile range finding, a lot of these detectors have been becoming better and better. And I was interested in this when I first arrived in Toronto, and we purchased some of these detectors. And this work happened here at University of Toronto at the Dunlap Institute. Um, here's Jerome Mayer. He was a postdoc here. And we purchased some of the most cutting-edge near-infrared detectors that we could get our hands on, and work with them in the lab to figure out, indeed, we could do near-infrared setting. So we built an instrument, through the little detector here, and we built an instrument and we put it at the telescope, at that original telescope at Lake Observatory. In 2015, we put that instrument up there. Um, this is Jerome here, again, Dan Wertheimer, some of our original team. Here's the telescope where the light comes in. Here's our instrument. And we're looking right now, in fact, about a dozen nights a month, doing the first ever near-infrared setting switch to see if there's any laser signals that are coming at infrared wavelengths. Now, here's our challenge. Kill the lights, it's really hard to see. Um, we're looking at one star at a time. A lot of the study searches just point over here, look at one star, point over here, well, it's really dark now. <laughs> but you can see, here's the sun at the center. Here's some nearby stars. This is 10 light years to show distance. It takes 10 years for light to travel to us. Um, this is why interstellar travel is really hard. Stars are far apart. And we look at one star at a time and look at a cadence of 10 to 20 minutes. And then we move on to the next star. So that should tell you something about how long we're visiting each star and the coincidence we have to be to get the signal. We can put on the lines again. So one of the things I'm interested in is trying to take study and moving it to looking at the entire sky and trying to do that all the time. So I want to end by talking about what's next with SETI. I think we need to look at study and look at all different wavelengths of light. Okay. We just we literally just scratched the surface. 
Radio studies pushing the newer observations today at more frequencies. They're trying to get more sensitive. I'll talk about that. Study teams are now looking at infrared wavelengths. Um, and we're trying to get to even better detectors. Now the challenge for this is that I reminded you that I'll remind you that we don't get government funding for being set. Okay, that got cut in 1988. But Congress has seemed interested in this. Um, last year I went to testify at the House Committee of Science and Technology on this topic of SETI and whether there should be further funds that go into investing in this research area. I think we need more people coming into SETI. Uh, creative thinkers, um, other scientists from other realms. Uh, we really have to be thinking creatively here. The crazy thing about all of this is that there's only about two dozen SETI researchers worldwide that actually dedicate their time and research to doing SETI. That's crazy for one of the most profound questions that we've been asking ourselves of whether we're alone in the universe. But things are changing and things are moving. China just built um, the largest radio telescope. It's called the FAST telescope. They actually built it really, really fast. There's a time lapse of them building it. It's like super, super fast. Um, that's 2011 to 2016 when they started. It's 500 meters in diameter. Um, Arecibo in Puerto Rico is about 300 meters. China's very interested in getting involved with doing SETI observations. Breaking Listen in 2015 um, is uh, help funded by Yuri Milner, who is a philanthropist. He's um, pledged $100 million over 10 years into SETI research to try to increase the amount of observations and observatories around the world that are doing these things. Um, he purchased time, in fact, he saved the 100 meter Green Bay Telescope in Virginia, because the National Radio Astronomy Observatories might have had to cut it. And he's also saved the Australia Large 64 meter Parks Telescope. And both of those are being dedicated to radio setting observations. On a side note, Yuri Milner is interested in doing breakthrough star shot. He wants to send little grand size robotic missions to Alpha Centauri. Guess what he wants to use to accelerate those? Lasers. He wants to take high power lasers, take a bunch of these grand size uh, satellites, accelerate them to one fifth the speed of light to get to Alpha Centauri in 20 years. I didn't talk about other things we had at Lick Observatory. I talked about near infrared study at Lick. We're also doing optical study using the automatic planet finder. It just does what it says, it's automatic planet finder. But we look in the data to see if there's any other signals that could be from ET. And then going to this idea for all sky of all time, we're in the middle of designing a new type of telescope using Fresnel lenses. Fresnel lenses are great, they're in projectors, they're also used in lighthouses, and they can magnify things really well. Um, and for the purpose of the study, which is a detailed thing to get into, they're very, very useful. So we purchased one of these recently, and we're designing where you make an array of these Fresnel lenses to make a geodesic dome that sits there and is constantly looking at the sky. We just finished our prototype a couple weeks ago. Um, that's one of those first lenses, and then our detector electronics that are going in back of it. So we hope to try to make an entire array for the survey. If you put multiple of these domes around the world, you'd be able to survey the entire sky all of the time, and really try to look at a brand new phase space to see if there's any other civilizations out there that are using lasers. There's also a gravitational lensing study. I really love this idea is that you send a satellite out really, really far in our solar system, okay, and you use the gravitational um, gravitation of the sun to magnify distant stars, distant signals. I love this it's fun idea. What about particles? Maybe it's not even light, guys. We're just barking at the wrong tree. Maybe they're communicating with neutrinos. People have thought about this using ice cube and these other neutrino observatories to see maybe if there's some rare particles out there that are not generated by something astrophysical. Okay. 
But with all of that, the question still remains. Where are they? Where, where are they? This is known as Fermi's Paradox. Enrico Fermi was an amazing physicist. This is the apparent science and age of the universe suggests that many technolo technologically advanced extraterrestrial civilizations ought to exist. However, this hypothesis seems inconsistent with the lack of observational evidence to support it. I'm going to end by going through a couple solutions. I don't have a solution, but I have a couple solutions I'd like to walk through for Fermi's paradox. Number one, we are alone. This is it, guys. Earths are rarer than we think. Maybe the moon needed to stabilize our orbit, and then we had to get stabilized, and then we had to have the right conditions for life to exist, and then life had to be stabilized, and we can't have too many things that happen to us so we can evolve. Okay. Um, this is also known as the lucky bacteria theory. <laughs> there are not enough habitable planets. Okay, this was used a lot when talking about Fermi's paradox. Fermi's paradox has been around for decades. They would come up with a rare earth. In the last five years, we know that's not true. Civilizations are extremely rare, and we are the first one to arise. Pat ourselves on the back for that one. We're unique. We're one of the first components of the universe to attain self-awareness in the galaxy. It's pretty good. All right, number two. Civilizations are common, but no one else has colonized the galaxy. Perhaps interstellar travel is even harder and costlier than we imagine, and we already imagine that it's really, really hard. Perhaps most civilizations have no desire to travel or colonize. Okay, David Greenspoon's quote, It is hard to believe that in every society that every form will transform themselves into sustainably living, granola munching, navel staring, contemplative Buddhists. Or maybe they have better things to do. Maybe it's not that important. <laughs> Perhaps most civilizations have destroyed themselves before they could explore. But hopefully, some intelligent life evolves from peaceful herbivores or photosynthetic life. We will never explore the stars because it is impossible, or we will destroy ourselves. Three, there is a galactic civilization. It has deliberately concealed itself from us. Life and civilizations are a dime a dozen. Why would they stop by? We're really not that interesting. <laughs> we are the galaxy's rookies who may be on the verge of a great adventure. And they're a baby in the prime directive of Star Trek. That's a bug of the boys. Um, I really enjoyed talking to you guys. I'm happy to take questions. Um, there's a lot to talk about SETI. Um, and again, thank you for the coordinators for arranging the Astro Tours um, lecture for tonight. Thank you.
those are very big questions, right? Reproduction, complexity, um, evolution, all go into that. We obviously have other intelligent life with us here. Okay, but dolphins don't have radio telescopes. And uh, when the purposes of study, we have to, um, for science and our signals, it's an artificial signal. So we have to look for technological imprints that may be sending us something. Which is different than to say maybe there's, there's, maybe there's other intelligent life out there. Maybe they exist, but maybe they're not even communicating. Okay, and I have one other thing to add to that. It's complicated too because if you look at where we're going, artificial intelligence, how we may even be non-biogenic, and trying to think about that and purposes of life, life or intelligent beings that may be communicating with us might not even be life. Thank you. For the, for the optical study, would that mean that the, uh, the other planet would be giving their signal directly at us only? Optical SETI um, would be beaming it towards our solar system. So as a laser beam goes out, it disperses. It gets wider and wider and wider. And most of that, even for that, those calculations of thousands of light years, that assumes that that beam encompasses our entire solar system. Now, yes, they do know, they would have to know we're here, but there's ways to transmit, uh, when I said we could transmit, we could actually transmit thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of stars. So they're not just stuck there in that one star. Hi, um, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around the, uh, why are so few dedicated researchers in the field? I mean, uh, aliens are kind of a popular theme in pop culture, on TV, movies. Why is the number of researchers so small in your favor? I have two answers for that. One is money. Um, to be to go into astronomy and science, you have to pursue a career, and to get further along in your career, you need funds to find yourself and find your research. And if those things are scarce, it's hard to keep any research program alive. The second thing is, I think it was actually taboo in astronomy and other science for quite a number of years. I, I there is. A lot of people pushing the rare earth um, for many decades. And I think I've seen, at least even in my own brief research career, a huge cultural change in the last decade. A decade ago, I wouldn't even tell anybody if they're not people study. But now I can go out and talk about this freely, and now that I'm an independent researcher, I can bring this my, bring it into my portfolio and do it. Um, and so I'm starting to see a big change, and I'm, I think we're catching up to what the public wants, and also um, pop culture. Thank you. Um, I think there's another explanation for why uh, we may not yet have an imperative life, even as intelligent as we are, um, which is that, suppose there's a civilization at the other end of the galaxy, which was at our stage. Our lasers wouldn't reach them. Their lasers wouldn't be just, and there could be all kinds of civilizations at that stage who are developed as much as we are, even a bit more. But because the galaxy is so big, even our Milky Way galaxy, we still can't contact each other with our current technology. And my other question is um, in our world, we've had civilizations encounter each other. And it hasn't always ended well. <laughs> and, um, in science fiction, there are different scenarios for when we encounter aliens, and sometimes it ends well, and sometimes it doesn't. And I was wondering if anybody in the second community had thought about if ET calls, or if we contact ET, what then? Okay, let me answer on both of those questions. The first question um, or comment really is a good one, which is, um, it's a long-term pen pal, right? We send a signal, and we have to send a signal, let's say it's a thousand light years, it has to take a thousand years to get there, we have to craft a little pen pal back and send it back, it's two thousand years later, we're still here. And the um, things, 
On the thoughts for such a community, again, go back to the lifetime of civilizations. Thousands of years is nothing if you're around for tens of millions of years. And so, again, that folds into this lifetime of civilizations about communication, hundreds of light years, thousands of light years. The second question um, was about if they're going to come and meet us. And what, I mean, you can say that, but I, I, I love sci-fi. And the SETI community has thought about it. Um, and a number of people um, think differently about this. Um, one of the things that's an important distinction is we are searching for extraterrestrial intelligence. We're not messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. The latter is called meta. And there are people on the globe right now that want to do meta. And the SETI community, we have drafted a letter and we put this out publicly, you can find it on the internet. It says that we should not start meta. We need to search for and learn more about our universe before we send our beacon call. Now, we are beaconing no matter what, because our signals are leaking out. But this is the question of whether it's directed or not. Um, it's challenging because people can do both things. Um, in our message, we talk a lot about that and how it needs to be an international effort and a, 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 a dialogue, not just with scientists, but everybody across the globe. Uh, you mentioned that there were uh, new findings with the WOW signal, so I was wondering what the updates are. Oh yeah, the WOW signal. Thanks for coming back to that. Um, the WOW signal was a, a radio signal that was received in the 70s um, that was unexplained for years. It was a very, very bright radio that could not be picked out. Um, and in fact, it's called WOW because the astronomer that received the signal, they got the signal and they literally wrote on the transcript, WOW! Explanation point because it was so bright. But it only happened once. Um, this year there was a paper out that tried to go back through different orbits of satellites that could potentially have been the carrier of that signal. I'm not saying that's what it was, but there was a paper that came out to try to say this really came from something terrestrial in this atmosphere. Um, but there's never been a signal like it again in that area of the sky. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for the really cool and thoughtful um, so I have a question that kind of goes back to the beginning of it. When you talked about how uh, the size of the planets that could contain life is so important, can you explain why it's size that matters as opposed to like radius from the sun that they're orbiting? That's a big question. I like. Do you want to take an astronomy class? <laughs> um, okay. Well, let's think about size for a little bit. When I was thinking, I think about size for many different reasons. But when I think about the terrestrial planet, we've got a hard surface. Right? We got rocks, we got, we got things on this planet. If it gets too large, you just end up with a gaseous giant. And we don't know how life will exist in a hydrogen heated gas. Maybe it does, hydrogen helium, but we don't know. So, life as we know it needs a hard surface. Um, so, you need a terrestrial planet. That's just composition. Okay? Then, let's go to your thing, which is it, it needs to be in the Goldilocks zone, just right from its star, right? To get, what we want as liquid water. Okay. Water is super important for life. Life as we know it. So if we want to think about life as we know it, we need to be at a certain distance from the star to allow the right radiance, the amount of light that hits the surface, to allow for liquid water. Third reason, we have an active surface. Geolog geologically, volcanoes and all of these things are, plate tectonics are super important for life here on Earth. It replenishes our atmosphere. To do that, we have an active core. Okay. There's nuclear fission happening in the core of our Earth, and those, for those things, you need heavy elements. Okay. If your planet is just too small, that cool, it cools out, and that's why Mars is dead. Okay. Mars was too small, it's a third of the size of Earth. Okay. It cools out. So the size of the planet dictates its geological activity, and then what composition it's made of, and then also the distance away from its star measures the amount of light that hits the surface. And again, that's just going with, if you're making a recipe book, how do you make life on Earth? Like, you gotta have carbon, you gotta have water. So life as we know it needs those conditions. Earlier in the talk, you were saying that uh, if other civilizations do exist, they're likely far more advanced than we are. Um, I was just wondering that given 
that poses an element of threat. Uh, why are we, what's the motivation for searching for? You just don't know the answer. I mean, um, let's say we, I get this question sometimes, like when do you call it quits? Let's say we search for a thousand years and we get really, really good with our technology. We will start to be able to place constraints on this thing of whether civilizations exist and exist now and communicate this way that might blow it out. But right now, my also my other part of the talk is we have barely, 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 barely searched. Okay? We have not dedicated the resources and intellect into this problem. But we just don't know. Right, thank you. Well, first of all, great talk, Professor. And uh, my question is in regards to the James Webb Telescope. How can astrobiologists and astrophysicists can, can take advantage of this, of this instrument to, to detect life out there? Uh, thanks. Um, thanks for that question. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope is the next and greatest telescope to launch uh, next year. And it's, I think, and it's hard to predict, but I think one of the major things that we will offer is understanding about um, how common molecules like amino acids and things that exist for life here on Earth, how common are they out in space? Not only that, where stars are forming and planets are forming. Okay, so we need to understand that as that gets into astrobiology and how common life may exist. And then James Webb, I think, will be revolutionary in trying to measure atmospheres of other planets. So they'll look at whether there are potential biosignatures. That too will tell you a lot about its geology, because we know geology can offer a lot to that atmosphere. And I'm sure it's going to offer things that none of us predict, which is the great thing about it. Hi, I was just wondering, um, say we had a uh, message that was a probable you know, alien civilization on our hands, um, your ideal scenario, I guess. Well, in that case, what would we even send back? Is there sort of a standard hello world that people would follow? <laughs> well, going back to the uh, lady asked the question about messaging, we don't have a standard for what we can do. We don't know what we're going to do. What do you guys think? I asked that original question, what would happen? Um, I can tell you what we would do as scientists, and then it would just go into like the world and we'll watch how the world reacts. Um, if our group gets a signal, or any of the other center researchers, which we sometimes do get candidate signals and they get rolled out and never go suppressed, we immediately send it to all the other teams around the world, to other telescopes to observe. So that the coordinate system, the signal, immediately goes public. Okay, so if you're worried about some conspiracy, or if I disappear one day, then I don't know. But, um, <laughs> But then what happens next, right? Let's say you do wake up tomorrow morning and we have a clear, unambiguous signal. Man, I don't know. <laughs> you know, these, these are big things, right? Um, we talk about how we make draft signals. A lot of people think about how we communicate with other intelligent life. You know, that's part of astrobiology. We think about how to communicate with dogs and dolphins. Like, how do we communicate what humanity is? First things on the Voyager. We did send a signal once with Arecibo purposely to a, um, a globular cluster. I didn't show the message uh, and as a backup slide. But people have thought about this. Okay, so we're not completely in the void, but people have thought carefully about what we would send. There's also going to be a million dollar prize, right, who's going to put out this next year to the entire globe. To, the question will be your question. If we got a signal and we had to send a signal back, what would we send? And how would you draft it? Um, and so, again, that's just for everybody. Thank you. Thank you all for your Before I let you all go, I'd like to remind you that we do have a reception with free food. It's in a building across the street from us, but we will have plenty of people on hand to guide you over there. I'd also like to take a moment to remind you to fill out your feedback forms and let us know what you thought of tonight's event and enjoy the rest of it over in the building next door. We'll have people collecting your forms at the back. And on behalf of Astro Tour,